Good morning, students. So, welcome to our fourth class on uh, Christopher Marlowe's play, The Tragical History of the Life and Death of Dr. Faustus. So, in our earlier classes, we have seen, um, uh, we have understood about the Renaissance period, about the dilemmas of a Renaissance man, about how, you know, chorus functions in a tragic play and also how uh, uh, the elements of miracle and morality plays of the medieval period have crept into or have come into the uh, uh, later Elizabethan plays as well. So in our previous classes, we have learned these things and uh, you uh, have started reading the play uh, Dr. Faustus. You actually, we actually in the class read about chorus, which is nothing but a prologue, which is nothing but prologue to the play. And now we are actually beginning the act and scenes of the play, right? Prologue, we don't count as act and scenes. So it is something that precedes the play. Uh, so right now in this class, we are going to see act one and scene one, which is a very, very important scene. It is as important as uh, the, uh, uh, the chorus scene that we saw in our previous class, right? So let us see what we are going to learn through this class. I'm going to introduce you to the opening scene. And more importantly, I'm going to tell you about the importance of the opening scene in this play as well as Elizabethan play in general, right? So in the Elizabethan play, these uh, opening scenes are really important. And through the example of Dr. Faustus, you will know actually how uh, they matter to the development of the plot at later stages, right? So now what is the session outcome? We're going to learn about the use, you're, you're going to learn about the importance of uh, opening scene. You're go going to learn about the device of the use of irony, uh, you know, the use of irony in the plays and also what kind of religious connotations uh, figure in the act uh, one and scene one of this uh, play. So students, to just recap what we did, uh, what we learned in the previous uh, class, we actually looked at prologue. You know, prologue precedes the scene in the place, in the scene. So what happened in the prologue? Prologue actually hinted at Faustus's character, right? Prologue actually told us what is the mistake Faustus is making in his life. And prologue also told us that there is some kind of, uh, there's some kind of fall that is going to happen for Faustus, right? So um, a pro prologue actually hinted us, you know, what is the tragic flaw in uh, Faustus's character? Tragic flaw, to use a Greek term, is nothing but hamartia. You know, hamartia is the tragic flaw, the fatal flaw in the central character, in the central character, which actually results in his or her doom, right? His or her fall. So prologue actually hinted us, give Faustus actually has the hamartia of extreme pride he he is really proud of what he has acquired and he wants more from life and added to that he has extreme longing for materialistic objects in the world all these things together are going to cause his fall and that is what prologue told us in and that is what chorus told us in the prologue right uh, so to use the prologue the chorus own words Heavens will conspire Faustus's overthrow. That is what Chorus told us because he is getting into cursed necromancy. Right? So continuing in the scene one of act one, what Chorus told us in the prologue is evident through the words of Faustus himself. Right? Faustus is contemplating. Faustus is alone in his study. He is sitting alone. Nobody is there. Faustus is thinking. Right? Faustus is thinking in his mind, but we know what Faustus is thinking. So how is it possible? What is the technique? So there is a dramatic technique, a stage technique called soliloquy, right? S-O-L-I-L-O-Q-U-Y, soliloquy. Soliloquy is a dramatic technique where the person on the stage is speaking to himself, right? He is speaking to himself, but then he is speaking loudly. He's speaking it loudly on the stage. So the audience who are sitting on the other side of the stage can hear what is happening in the mind of the character. So that is what is happening in the soliloquy of Dr. Faustus as well. 
right? He is sitting in a study, he is talking to himself, he is expressing what is happening in his mind and the audience sitting on the other side know very well actually what is uh, what are the thoughts of Faustus? What is Faustus thinking? We know through the Act 1, Scene 1, uh, uh, where uh, Faustus is uh, thinking aloud. So let me tell you briefly what happens in this scene. So first, like I told you, Faustus is, Faustus' is soliloquy is what we start with, where he is thinking aloud, followed by he calls his servant Wagner, he calls his servant Wagner to invite his friends, to invite his two friends, right? Valdis and Cornelius. So that is what he instructs Wagner. Wagner goes out and then good angel and bad angel appear on the stage. Remember in our earlier classes, we have talked about the elements of morality plays that slowly or that have um, got continued in the later Elizabethan uh, plays as well, where the elements like good angel and bad angel, seven deadly sins, all these things personified um, virtues and vices appear on the stage, right? That That is there, that feature has continued. The same feature of morality play, that is the good and the personified good and evil angels also appear uh, on the stage in Act 1, Scene 1. So as soon as Wagner goes out to invite Valdez and Cornelius, good angels and bad angels appear before Faustus. They come before Faustus debating, telling him something. Obviously, they are two contrastive forces, good and evil. So they are trying to tell some Faustus something that are actually diametrically opposite. Right? So following that, you know, the Faustus' friend, Cornel, uh, uh, Valdus and Cornelius come to Faustus' study. They discuss with Faustus at length. Faustus is telling them something and they agree. In the end, they agree upon something. Right? So that is what happens uh, in Act 1, Scene 1. And uh, we're going to get into it slowly now. Right? So let's see what happens in Act 1, Scene 1, beginning Faustus' Cyrillic. So, uh, first, uh, the opening scene starts with a long soliloquy of Dr. Faustus. He appears in his study, contemplating how he has mastered over all the knowledge available, uh, all lines of scholarship um, uh, he has been, you know, trying to uh, logically reason out what is better for him. And then, but he he realizes that a greater subject, something that is not what he has acquired so far, a greater subject fits his mental capacities, right? So he considers different fields, one after the other. So Faustus, uh, in the beginning, he says, Faustus assumes that he has mastered every art and works like Aristotle's. And thus he declares, you know, what Faustus declares, then read no more. Thou has attained that end. A greater subject fitted Faustus' wit. So Faustus' wit, Faustus' you know, knowledge, Faustus' cerebral capacities, capacities need a greater subject is what he declares. So after that, Faustus considers one, you know, different lines of scholarship that he can pursue, obviously for no, uh, for no um, satisfaction. Faustus considers different streams of scholarship like analytics, logic, medicine, only to conclude that he has mastered over all these fields or that they are not sufficient for his capabilities. His extreme pride in his own knowledge is revealed when he says, is not thy common talk sound aphorisms? He says, you know, if you talk about aphorisms, Faustus thinks his, his common talk, his normal talk, day-to-day -day talk will also sound like aphorisms. See his pride there? So neither medicine nor law succeeds in satisfying Faustus' craving for learning. He proudly uh, bids farewell to physics. He goes on bidding farewell. And it's interesting when we read. He goes on bidding farewell to each of these disciplines. So he says uh, medicine cannot satisfy him because medicine cannot make men live eternally. Look at his longings, what he wants, right? 
Uh, so he wants, uh, he doesn't want medicine because it cannot make men live eternally. It cannot raise the dead from, um, raise the dead from death. It cannot raise the dead people into life again. So he bids farewell to physics. And then next he goes to, you know, he goes on using Latin, interspersing Latin in his speech. And then next he says, uh, you know, he talks, he considers law, legal uh, uh, body of knowledge. He considers law and law, according to him, to quote, too servile and illiberal for me. So law cannot satisfy him. It is too illiberal and too servile. It doesn't liberate him. So he wants freedom. So, you know, Faustus also wants some kind of, you know, liberating a feeling through a learning. He wants liberating feeling. Sounds familiar? We also want that, right? We want some kind of freedom, some kind of, you know, openness when we learn. So that is what Faustus wants. So law cannot because law scripts, you know, law goes on, um, allow, you know, applying strictures. It says, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. So he doesn't want. It is too illiberal for him. So, and then next, so that he bids farewell to law and next he comes to divinity. You know, the um, not now, but then more prominent, you know, the most prevalent uh, knowledge at that time was to know about God. So divine divinity. He comes to divinity about reading about Bible and other things. So even that does not satisfy him because the, the, the predominant, the fundamental principle, the fundamental idea running in the uh, Christian uh, belief is that the reward of sin is death and uh, the Christian uh, belief system also tells that every human actually invariably sins. So Faustus Lord, you know, has a reasoning. He thinks if every human invariably sins and the result of it is invariably death, then why don't I actually go ahead and do a sin? Why don't I go actually go ahead and commit a sin is what Faustus you know, reasons out. So anyway, death is uh, for sure, death is definitely there. So we must die an everlasting death anyway. So why not actually commit some sin and die is what Faustus logically reasons out, right? Sounds also logical, right? Yes. So then the next is what? So all these things are ruled out. Faustus challenges the Christian tenets by questioning the belief around sin and death. Uh, so, if all beings sin and thus die, Faustus debates why one shouldn't sin at all, right? So, when his hubris refuses to acknowledge any field of scholarship as worthy of pursuing, now Faustus turns towards metaphysics, I'll quote, metaphysics of magicians and necromantic books, right? So, he's turning to magic, he's turning to necromancy, black magic, right? So, they seem, I quote, to, to Faustus' eyes, they seem heavenly. They seem heavenly. See the irony here? The necromantic books, which are going to cause his fall, which are, which are going to make sure Faustus gets into hell, are, to quote, heavenly for Faustus. This is irony. Right? We're going to learn about irony. You're going to observe. You have to observe the ironic elements in the play as well. So one of it is to start with now. I'm saying Faustus says it is heavenly when it is actually hellish, right? So, okay, so Faustus finally declares that mag magic and necromancy, A, these are those that Faustus most desires, right? Faustus most desires, oh, what a world of profit and delight of power, of honor, of omnipotence, right? Uncooked. So this is what Faustus wants. Faustus wants power. Faustus wants honor. Faustus wants omnipotence, control over everything in the world, right? So all these he wanted to possess was a world of profit and delight, of power, of honor, of omnipotence. He wanted control over all the things. He wanted control over all the things in the world and he wanted to, he wanted kings to bow before him, uh, bow before his omnipotent power, right? Remember Ozymandias, right? 
So first is realize that the only way of acquiring such invisible power, invincible powers was through magic and that a sound magician is a mighty god. Very, very important line. A sound magician is a mighty god. Here, Faustus tire the brains to gain a deity. Right. So that is what unquote Faustus wants. I'll quote again. A sound magician is mighty god. Here, Faustus tire thy brains to gain a deity. So Faustus wants to equate himself to God. Right? The first and the most blasphemous thing he is committing right now is he wants to equate himself to God. Remember, this is 16th century. Obviously, the ideas are not as secular as we have now. Secular in the sense, uh, you know, less belief in God. So, they were staunchly religious. And now, Faustus is declaring he wants to be as equal as God. As mighty, as strong, as omnipotent as God. And that is his hubris. And that is his hamartia. That is the tragic flaw he is committing. Right? So that is the that is the end of Faustus's long soliloquy. Next, he calls in the next small scene, the next small uh, um, uh, small piece. He calls Wagner, his servant, and he says, "Call my I'll quote dearest friends." He wants his dearest friends. Who are they? The German dear his German dearest friends are Waldus and Cornelius. He wants Wagner to call them, and Wagner goes out. Right. Next, I told you the element of morality plays good and evil angel come on stage. In this short intervention, they attempt, they are personified, remember, they speak, they appear in person. So, in front of Faustus, Faustus, Faustus can see them. In a short intervention, they attempt to persuade Faustus on their side, right? So, as the name says, they are two diametrically opposite forces, good and evil. So, they want to pull Faustus on their side. Good ones on, uh, good ones Faustus on its side and evil ones Faustus on um, its side. Right? So, they want Faustus on their sides while the good angel warns, good angel says, warns Faustus about how he will reap God's wrath. God's anger through his blasphemous involvement, through his blasphemous involvement in necromancy. On the other hand, bad angel entices, you know, attracts Faustus to assume superhuman powers on earth like Jove in the sky, the god Jove in the sky, right? This is what good and bad angels do. So, good angel says, and heap God's uh, heavy wrath upon thy head. Read, read the scriptures. That is blasphemy. It says, read the scriptures. Uh, uh, Faustus don't read necromantic books is what good angel says. While the evil angel declares that famous art, you know, magic, that famous art wherein all nature's treasure is contained. Be thou on, or, uh, on earth as Jove is in the sky is what the evil angel says. So they exit from the stage declaring it very in a very short of um, five six lines then Faustus thinks obviously Faustus is determined his mind is made up he wants what evil angel is offering him right so Faustus is unmoved by the warnings of the good angel for he is driven by a lust for materialistic gains he desired to acquire objects from across the seas and lands and reign, I'll quote, reign sole king of all the provinces, unquote. So he wants to rule over the world. So that is what Faustus, uh, discuss, Faustus thinks after the good and evil angels leave. So we know Faustus has decided, Faustus is determined, Faustus has, has made up his mind. So next, remember, he had sent Waldus to call his friends Valdus and Cornelius. So they come. So they come to meet Faustus. So what happens when they come? So Valdus and Cornelius are Faustus's German friends, enter his study, and a long deliberation takes place between the two parties. Faustus explains how all lines of learning, you know, uh, so Faustus, uh, good in bandages, we discussed that. Then, um, so Faustus uh, 
you know discusses foster tells uh, uh, that uh, explains them how all lines of learning have failed to attract him and how he desires to possess magic with their help right while this and cornelius help so he uh, let me uh, read foster's words here brilliant words so he says philosophy is odious and obscure both law and physic are for petty wits divinity is basest of the three unpleasant harsh contemptible and vile it is magic magic that has ravished me right beautiful lines where is dismissing all lines of knowledge and actually telling us it is only magic that is enticing him right so that is what he tells valdes and cornelius valdes and cornelius agree to help him and uh, they all um, exit to have dinner together so they they valdes and cornelius tell they're going to teach fosters the fundamentals of magic so finally they exit the scene the scene ends with these two lines for before i sleep here i sleep i'll try what i can do this night i'll conjure though i die therefore that is what foster says the last line of this scene is very clear foster also knows at the back of his mind ki something wrong is going to happen something wrong is going to come out of this right i'll conjure tonight so foster just wants to live tonight even if he has to die after this right so he wants to live this moment you know carpe diem what cover you know the poets use this idea of carpe diem live sees the day today you live right so fosters wants to live today even if he has to die tomorrow even if he has to reap the results of today's blasphemous acts tomorrow so uh, that is how the scene ends um so um, so let's see what is the importance of the scene so all through my talk i have already told you uh, how uh, what is the importance of the scene so you know foster's charis is revealed to us so this through this long soliloquy foster's reveals uh, i mean we are i mean what is revealed is foster's thirst for learning and questioning mind see it's a you know characteristic feature of the renaissance man where he is questioning all streams of knowledge particularly divinity right is questioning the tenets of christian beliefs so that is very characteristic of a renaissance man so they are actually reasoning it out you know they are not uh, accepting scriptures as they have come they are reasoning it out right so and what we also see um, renaissance man's dilemma is what we see here introduces the conflict between the limits of human knowledge and the longings to go beyond the image of the renaissance man you know oscillating between the two points of christian marvels and hellenistic longings longings to have materialistic objects is evident through the soliloquy of fosters renaissance period's characteristic of a longing for liberation from christian ethical frameworks in favor of what in favor of an essentially free and dynamic human a human who is more free say remember he says when it comes to law law is too servile and illiberal this is right so he wants freedom so dynamic human is what we see is what is what fosters is asking for fosters also questions the christian notions of sin and death in his soliloquy lending voice what is he lending voice is lending voice to the renaissance period suspicion over moralistic frameworks that is what we see that is what you are going to actually remember through foster's character and actually in a sense that is what makes us a foster's dear to us you know foster's is not a clear cut bad character he has this you know what he is asking for is something we might ask at some stage of our lives right so we cannot be very judgmental about foster's at some point we also sympathize with foster's right so that is what we saw <laughs> let's see so uh the what are the somarlo's use of latin as what i told you he disperses he actually um you know spread sprinkles latin over his long soliloquies so we know the influence of latin here uh, so the uh, you know the conflict between limitations of human knowledge and the desire to go beyond i told you renaissance mind dilemma is also hinted at in the opening scene um so next what we have is religious connotations i told you continuing the same point 
how you know fosters refers to the concept of sin and death biblical concepts of sin and death and how actually he is trying to thwart the ideas he is trying to some kind of do away with the ideas of sin and death so in his effort to escape death fosters resorts to necromancy which will lead to his spiritual death we know it will lead to his spiritual death so all these are these are the religious connotations that are available to us through the thing so next the use of irony i told you i give you one example in the beginning that heavenly like in, in referring to necromantic books he says they are heavenly whereas actually they are hellish they are devilish fosters believe that new powers will bring about salvation whereas actually we know he also in a sense knows that they are going to lead to his damnation so that is the irony you know? uh, he refers to books as heavenly but they are actually satanic right fosters uses religious imagery to matters which bring about his damnation actually so this is irony used in another uh, theatrical device like soliloquy i told you irony is another theatrical device and that is what is available to us in this that is what we can witness through this scene as well okay so so what we learned through this class we we'll, we saw fosters soliloquy we saw the appearance of personified good and evil angels and we learned about the importance of opening scene we also saw how what kind of religious connotations are he uh, are um, infused into the text and what is the irony you know what are the ironic implications of what fosters is thinking and doing in the play okay so let's stop there we'll move to the next scene in our next class thank you